Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, this, this might be the first in a, in a series of presentations for raising capital. Today we'll, we'll do an introduction to raising capital and really touch on some basics. Um, uh, also in the room, uh, I have a Terra Protein um, director, Steve McLaughlin, just behind you, Helen. Steve uh, is based in Edinburgh and focused mainly on raising capital for African countries, uh, for African companies. Um, and, and also in the room, uh, Andrew McCallery, who was with, uh, with NAB Agribusiness for many years, and also, I believe, the longest serving director of legal at UNE. Quite an honour. Um, so very familiar with, uh, with negotiations, contracts, etc. So perhaps after the presentation, we'll, we'll all be around a little bit if you've got any specific questions for us. Uh, today I will have a slideshow, um, which is really just to, to help me stick to, stick to the script. It will be available after the presentation uh, for, all, for all founders. Um, and also there will be some other templates and models available for those that are interested. So Helen, I see you taking notes, feel free, but all of this will be available and you can download it all at a later time. So uh, very quickly, the most boring part of the presentation, my background, uh, I'm originally from, from Longreach. My family have a sheep and cattle farm there, still do. Uh, after a few years in, uh, after attending uni here myself, I had a few years in live export and organic meat sales. And then I joined a company called Morgan's, or then called AB and Amro Morgan's, at the time of the Telstra 3 share float. Some of you might, be, might remember that in 2005. Um, and I, I had no experience at all in capital finance, and I was helping uh, in the mailroom during the Telstra 3 share float. And that started a career of uh, 14 years now um, in equity capital markets. I'll put in reverse order some of the uh, transactions or capital raisings I've been involved with uh, over the years um, in primarily the agriculture sector. Um, some companies you might be familiar with there, uh, but most of them up until, uh, up until 2016, all of these here were ASX listed companies. So these were IPOs or initial public offerings or follow on capital raisings. But once I joined Terra Protein Equity Partners in 2016, the focus became private equity. So something that might be a bit more relevant to us here in the SRI. So let's keep things fairly straightforward today. Let's look at some basics, the, uh, the who, what, where, why, and how. Um, I'm going to start with why. Why do you need to raise money? It might sound like a very silly question, but I'll get you to ask yourself some simple questions um, about why you're doing it. Uh, what type of capital should you raise? We'll look at several different types of capital and get you thinking about what might best suit your business. Uh, who are my potential investors? We'll look at different types of investors that are out there and what they're looking for. Where are they? Um, we'll look at some different countries with different macro trends that you'll need to think about if you're looking at attracting capital from those countries. Uh, when should I raise capital? Uh, uh, a seemingly silly question, but it's very important, the timing of your capital raising in terms of your considerations, but more importantly, those of your targeted investor. Finally, how do I raise capital? We'll look at some simple tools and guidelines for you to follow for when you're ready to raise capital. Why do I need to raise money? Of course, you may have your own, your own uh, reasons, growth, development, but raising capital is not, may not be in your best interest. It can be expensive. It can have legal fees and charges. You will often have to travel to find your investors to, to meet with them. It almost certainly will carry an increased admin burden. If you take on an investor, you will have almost certainly more governance and reporting. Uh, you may not lose control, but if you issue even just one share in your business, you are giving up some ownership of your business, and, and that may not be in everyone's uh, uh, um, objectives. 
Uh, in terms of debt, it obviously brings with it you know, potential cash flow concerns. If you're not cash flow positive, repaying interest and principal may, may cause you difficulty if you're not able to meet them. We always say when you're asking, uh, when you're thinking of raising capital, always consider the return on investment for that capital you're raising. Um, if you raise $100, how many dollars of value will you create with it? Value in earnings, value in increased assets. Uh, what is that money that you're raised going to be used for? And there are positive and negative reasons. Very simply, if you're growing your business, growing the earnings, growing the value, that's a positive reason. If you're buying a loss-making or depreciating asset, sometimes that can be a long-term benefit but that's going to have negative returns per share or negative EPS on your business and covering short-term or non-essential expenses with raising capital is just a simple no-no. That'll be a negative return on investment. So you really do ask yourself time and time again, would I be better off bootstrapping a little bit longer until I can demonstrate that my capital raise is for positive reasons? What types of equity should I raise? I might just hand, hop up. So let's look at the three, equity, debt, and then a hybrid. This chart on the side, let's assume on the y-axis we've got your value, uh, the value of your business, whether it's revenue or the value of your assets, and then on the, um, on the x-axis is years. In the very, very early stage, the beginning of your business, you might look at it's, it's a horrible term, the three Fs, friends, fools and family, often the first place to get your initial startup capital. Then you might, there might come angel investors, early stage individual investors, and we'll talk a bit more about angel investor networks in a minute. Venture capital, also early stage, but institutional investors. So these are companies or funds set up to invest in early stage businesses. As you get a bit further along in years and a bit more revenue, a bit more asset value, you might be attractive to private equity, uh, which is a later stage, somewhere around here, equity investor, or public equity, such as I talk, touched on before, uh, listing on the ASX or, or other international securities exchanges. Debt capital, a lot of you would be very familiar with, um, but the, the, there are many forms of debt capital. Um, and it's just always important to think of the repayment facility, the, your ability to make those repayments. And a combination of both, hybrids or, or mezzanine capital, and this is something that, that, that could be relevant for the founders in the SRI. Hybrid capital is part equity and part debt. Now, what I mean by that is initially you might be uh, agreeing a loan note, a document that says, um, uh, the, the borrow, borrower, me, will issue this co a note to the borrower and I will repay that loan. Uh, if I don't, it might be converted into equity, into shares in the business. That's a, a classic example. The reason hybrid might be relevant to startup businesses is because it's a loan, we're not issuing equity today when the value of the business might be, might be low. We might be issuing equity in five years' time or in 10 years' time, by which stage we might have grown the revenue and the assets. So if I'm issuing 5% of equity in my business today, it might be worth very little, but in 10 years' time or in five years' time, that 5% might be worth a lot more. So it's hybrid or mezzanine capital is, is something that I think will be relevant to, to, uh, to some of our founders. It's something everyone's sick of hearing at the, at the, in the small talk or at the end of advertisements, but always ask a financial advisor, accountant or lawyer, a friend. If you don't have a stockbroker or an accountant, or just ask a friend that works in the industry. Just tell them what you're thinking of doing with your business. They will be able to point you in the right direction. Just a cup of coffee with someone where you can say, this is my business, I'm thinking of raising capital. Uh, a little bit of detail they should be able to say you should raise equity or you can think about raising equity or no, your valuation is not high enough yet, you should think about raising debt uh, or, or mezzanine or hybrid finance. 
Who are my potential investors? Uh, Steve and I often put them into buckets. Very, very simply, when you're starting at the beginning of finding investors, which bucket am I, am I going to be looking in? Strategic investors, so very straightforward. These are your partners, people you deal with in your business already, customers, suppliers, competitors, shareholders or stakeholders in your competitors, people that might be familiar with your business and might be attracted to your business for strategic reasons, the wheels of cooperation, quite like co-investment or, or joint ventures. And, and that's, what, that's the bucket that you'll find joint venture partners or um, strategic investors. Financial investors, as it suggests, they're set up to, to find and deliver financial benefit to their stakeholders, usually in investors. So these are funds, um, pension funds, listed investment companies that might not know anything about your business or even the industry you operate in. They're purely set up to deliver financial benefit. They're non-dilutive. So non-dilutive means that they're not, um, uh, their investments, they're not looking for equity in your business that will dilute you or dilute debt holders. They just want to support you. Um, the most obvious example there is MDC, MLA's donor company. Um, I think a few of you might be familiar with them. They've invested in some 2000 uh, agri-tech companies in Australia um, and they provide uh, are you familiar with them, Dave? You've got a you've got you've got MDC funding, yeah. And that's that's not, to my knowledge, that's not an actual ownership in your business. No, it's not. But it's not as simple as just handing money. So it was a fifty-fifty funding agreement whereby you had to prove you had market capital for the overall yep. um, investment. It was based on a particular project, so it was a project-based thing. Mm. Um, that had to align with one of their goals. And the other thing was there are provisions um, in the agreement where if you fail to make a commercial product at the end of the agreement, then they uh, assume ownership of your intellectual property. Right, yep. So it wasn't just a nothing. It was like you had to make and yeah. deliver this product to the industry otherwise. Presumably they wanted that product or that service that you were creating to benefit their members. That's, yeah, so that was mm. part of that. And I, I don't um, know exactly what the provisions of the way the NBC are, mm. but they are aligned broadly with um, the goals of MLA, um, MLA's mm. research. Yep. Um, and the, the industry direction. So they're given a top 10 hit list of things that yeah. they might have to address. Yep. The MDC is directed to invest strategically to try and um, address those issues. Right. So, for example, the sheep genetics, I think they have an objective of doubling genetic um, output with by, by 2030 or something, doubling the value of genetic uh, gain by 2030 or something like that. So, if you can demonstrate that you fit that need. Yeah. 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 Product, um, is an information gathering device and uh, mm. Of yeah. So we fit it sort of. Mm. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, Helen. Meat and Livestock Australia. So they're the statutory organisation responsible for. Uh, is Meat and Livestock donor uh, company? Donor company. Yeah. Yeah. Another little saying that, that Steve and I have, finding the perfect partner is more important than not finding any. Put, it, put that another way, finding the wrong investor can be more troublesome than finding any investor. If, if it's another saying of ours, if it's just a, a good time Charlie that's new to agriculture or new to technology, new to your industry and think it's just it's, it's something wonderful, I've got no experience in it, that can, um, that can, when things might go wrong, and they often do, and they're not aware of them, they're not familiar with the risks, uh, you can get into situations that you really didn't intend and can, can cause trouble. So 
we would often say you're better off not sometimes not finding the investor than finding the wrong investor. Where are my potential investors? I just thought I'd put this up. Let's look at some of the macro trends for various uh, investor markets. Let's start with the US. Um, there's probably uh, two key themes as far, and I'll just, I'll mainly focus on agricultural investment. Two key themes that have been driving the North America, so Canada and US, um, agricultural investment. Historical, historically low interest rates. So they're as low as they've, they've, they've they recently have risen, but they have been as low as they've ever been in the US. There's been huge fiscal stimulus. Um, so people are looking for um, low or traditionally low yielding. They don't need higher yields uh, for their equity investments. That extreme amount of stimulus has also given investors long term concerns about inflation. They're not a concern at the moment, but they need to know that if they're parking, they're making investments, that they're going to be uh, inflation hedged. There are a few better inflation hedges than agriculture. So uh, taking those two factors into consideration, a lot of North American investors are looking for agricultural investments that, um, that are CPI hedged, basically. The other important difference about the US is that they have something we don't, which is called, which are called defined benefit pension schemes. That's effectively a superannuation fund that will put money away for 15 years, um, typically 15 years. Can be longer, can be shorter. Um, so they're looking for assets all around the world that they can park money in for 10, 15, 20 years. They don't need it back by then. They don't even need a, a, a dividend over that period but they want an inflation hedge or something that will outperform the consumer price index, CPI, over, over that period. That is why we've seen, particularly in Australia, a lot of North American pension funds investing in land. It's agricultural land is a natural CPI or inflation hedge. A lot of them don't need to operate it. They're happy to just buy land, lease it back to a farmer, a good farmer, get a very low operating return of three to 5% um, and then just wait 15 years until they sell the assets and they get capital growth as well. Moving across to Europe, also historically low interest rates, record uh, fiscal stimulus. Um, but something a little bit different there is there's a, a touch of food security concern. So there are countries there that are worried about feeding themselves. They have huge um, uh, uh, subsidy programs for agriculture to make sure that they never go back to the dark days post-World War II where people were literally starving. So they, they will have huge food concerns and that plays a big part of their investor appetite. But also uh, they're interested in um, ESG, environmental social governance issues. A lot of investors, agricultural investors there, will adhere to UN principles and other um, globally recognised animal welfare standards. Um, they're often seeking social benefit. Um, for example, Steve uh, raised capital for a business in Malawi recently and the investor came from the UK and they were looking for financial, there was a financial investor in the financials bucket, but they were looking also for social benefit. They wanted to know that the money that they put into Malawi was going to benefit Malawians socially. And the, the project was actually about increasing their production, a little pork abattoir, that was going to make 100 gram um, pork sausages to be sold just at the, at the bus stops outside. Instead of um, creating sausages and meat to be exported, it had to benefit the local local um, customers. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. So, for example, uh, the Dutch Development Bank, 
would expect you to spend, say, 25% of the capex of that project on Dutch equipment. Yeah. Going in. Really good point, Steve. Um, a, a project in Chile that Terra Protein was involved in, the investor came from Denmark and a, de a Danish um, development institute, finance institution. They, they put capital into a pork business in Chile, exactly as Steve said, they required an amount of equipment to be sourced from Denmark. So they're investing offshore, but it ultimately does benefit um, uh, some of the domestic producers and, and manufacturers. Uh, I think just to add to that as well, we're starting to see a lot of European countries looking at uh, companies looking to invest in technology yes. in other parts of the world that they can take back to Europe and do exactly like that through their investments. Yep. So, and we've got a very good example of a friend of ours that's involved in a company in the UK that's invested in a technology company in agriculture in Australia. They're significant. And that's exactly the argument that they go. Um, yeah. So how would something like Siemens, If they invest in technology offshore, if, if they're investing in it, then they're taking a part ownership in it. And in some cases, they might be buying a controlling interest. So, for example, if there's a, um, te a telephone telecommunication company in Indonesia, they might buy 51% of it, and effectively they can control that from the... That, that becomes a German business. That becomes the, under their control, yeah. So in Asia, um, a lot of us would be familiar with Asia investment in Australian agriculture. Um, China at the moment, it was Japan in the 80s and 90s, I think. Was that right, that about right, Dave? When Japan was the... Yeah. 70s, 80s, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, um, the, the, the key themes, I mentioned food security in, in um, Europe. It, that's amplified in Asia. There are some of the countries there really, really do have their food security concerns. Uh, a few times now, China has tried to be self-sufficient in soybeans um, and have put up, ta put up tariffs for importing uh, soybeans and they, they had to remove them completely because they just simply didn't have enough for their domestic production. Uh, we're seeing that now in pork. In uh, China is the world's largest pork producer with 700 million sows, 800 million sows. But there's a disease outbreak called African swine fever, which estimates vary, but let's say 200 million sows are going to be slaughtered. Uh, they've got no choice but to import just to feed their country. Um, so they put 30% tariffs on... US imports, they have no choice but to pay their own tariffs because they, they need the product. So food security is a major issue. Um, another th theme that we've identified is there are also, um, I don't, don't mean to focus on China, but we've seen a lot of China investment in Australian agricultural land, and a lot of them aren't agricultural producers in Asia, in China. They're property developers. They might be manufacturers. They might be involved in something completely unagriculturally related. It could be that their focus is not on um, sourcing food, but simply to uh, take capital out of, out of China, where they're, uh, some of you might know, but I believe it's a 50,000 US dollar limit on taking um, what currency out of China in cash. But if, you're, if you wish, you can acquire a business for, uh, I think it's a billion and a half is the limit, and effectively you've, you've just transferred your currency into another currency. So that's why, we've, in our opinion, we've seen a lot of um, investment in Australian land, very price insensitive. They don't really care about the price because that's just the, more, the higher the price, the more they're able to take offshore. Really? 
the other day. Really? A whole, a whole day. And the manager said, I've got this big year, they're just not a bit running all mm. right. Now they've invested so much, bought the whole lot. I yeah. mean, that's, that's Australian plan, but that's where they're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not trying to um, to cast any view view on it, but it, it's it's pretty clear that not all the Chinese investors are agricultural producers themselves. Um, a lot of them, though, are coming back to the food security. Uh, they're interested in not just the production of an asset, but the funnel through which that commodity must go, such as an abattoir, grain accumulation sites, ports. Uh, inf critical infrastructure, once the, someone owns that funnel, they don't need to own the farm because it, it will that product will come through there at some stage. So <laughs> take a look at the, well, in, in coal, uh, or do you mean the port at Abbott no, Point? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is not just... Uh, Asian investors, mind you. If you take a look at all of the large Australian companies that have been taken over by internationals, um, um, ABB A and then AWB, Maryborough Sugar, um, major infrastructure companies have been bought by international companies who want to own that funnel. If you own, if you own for example, uh, Grain Corp, you own most of the major grain handling ports out of Australia. I mean, it's rather simplistic, but if, you're, if you've got grain ports all over the world, you can turn this tap off <laughs> to, to, get, uh, to get desired results from other taps. A little bit um, my own personal view, but I think it's quite interesting the reasons international investors look at uh, various assets in Australia. When is the right time for you to raise capital? Silly question, you know, whenever you need it, depending on when you need to further your research, develop your product, um, invest in some uh, marketing, ramping up. Maybe you might have a, a business that you might look to acquire to, to build some market share. Um, but it's so important to think about external factors when raising capital. Time to prepare. I don't think a single project that Terra Proteins worked on has ever got that, got that right. It is always longer than you think it will take. Um, uh, um, there won't be information available that you, that you need. Uh, you, you will always take a little bit more time than you think to prepare for your capital raising. Investor availability might sound silly, but if you're thinking to raise capital in, from Australian institutional investors, between January and March, it won't happen. They'll be at the beach. I mean, they, they just won't be there. Um, so it'll be in Europe, July. In Europe, yeah. September, September. Yeah. So just, just, you know, it's a little thing, but, you know, if you're urgently raising capital, think about the timing. Um, you can always go earlier. Uh, in Australia, you can raise capital from institutions up until Christmas Eve. But after Christmas Day, forget about it until March. Um, investor due diligence and requirements. A again, this is always underestimated. Um, investors in our projects have often required three, four, even five site visits to go and see exactly the same thing. Then they tell their boss and then their boss needs to come and see it. And it just, it just takes time. Um, that's that's true. Mm. And investor approvals. Sometimes institutional investors, they might have an investment committee that meets weekly. Sometimes they meet quarterly. Um, so if you're if they've just met and you're putting a proposal in front of them, they might not be able to approve it for another three months. So there are all of these external factors you need to think about, and of course, FERB. Um, as well if, if the investment is above $15 million in agribusiness. We always say this, the best time to raise capital is before you need it. Um, it will benefit you in so many ways if you can look across the table from the investor and say, um, we're raising this capital, uh, it will help us, but we don't need it. The moment the investor thinks you desperately can't live without them, that will go to valuation. in a non-positive way. 
Uh, how do you do it? Let's look at a couple of simple tools and guidelines. How do you prepare your capital raising? How do you search for your investors? How do you value your business? Then how do you negotiate and execute the deal? How do you prepare? We'll look at six items. Firstly, your vision. I know it's incredibly simple, but you must know what your vision is for the next five to 10 years. You must know where you're going. You must develop a business plan your ask, what will you ask the investor for? What do you need from them? And what are you prepared to give them? And put that into a financial model. Doesn't need to be um, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing in the world, but you do need to show how your vision happens by the numbers. Plan your... Is that, that there? One of the biggest points that's lacking in startup companies or family companies that I've seen from mm. companies. Exactly what I'm going to be speaking to clients about in Africa this afternoon, they don't have it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, just to follow up on your comment, Mr. Uh, and then I mentioned this earlier, the mezzanine offering that organized, for example. What do you think is the typical dollar threshold at which private equity comes to receive that type of approach? Because when you say, So I, my, my perception is that you need to be following a, a decent sum of money and the EP model, whoever is interested in offering a convertible note, mm. um, will do a thorough DD and will expect confidence of certain financials. And there seems to be some sort of perception, at least, that it's a bit incongruous for the start. Yeah. So, what, what is the if there is a lovely dollar threshold, which mm. you do the right offering on actually Yeah. Of the, of the two smaller transactions I've done recently, yeah. that cap was coming in. Like and that was, that was $5 million and... Yeah, it just seemed to be three and a half. Yeah. Um, so I think the biggest thing is the flexibility that it gives you, because quite often you've got to come to the camp, negotiate a position term, Flexibility yeah. on, on achieving your strategy. If you're very confident in being conservative in your growth plan and that you're going to meet it, I think it's the very best way for a small company to grow because it allows you to retain your equity. Yeah. The other thing that I would say, and what I'm just speaking to attend is now, that fairly often that vessel of finance will be seen by senior debt providers' equity. So if you come to a stage where you really need extra cash and you want to go back to the bank, Fully diluted, That's right. That's exactly right. So, if um, and and Maka, to your point, um, institutional investors will have a threshold there, yeah, and some of them, a couple of million dollars, I suppose. But there's no reason you couldn't do a convertible note with an individual, yeah, you know, with a with a, an angel investor, or even, yeah, you know, my parents could do a convertible note for. Yeah, for, for our business or something like that, or yeah, Steve could do a convertible note with me. Yeah, I mean, I have seen plenty of those types of agreements that just not a, a small dollar company. Mm. Most of them are not. Yeah, when you compare to small dollar companies, you know, they're not a Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's why I'm saying I would have thought it might not necessarily suit the SRI, but that's why I'm asking. So, if the venture capital companies are really looking after the product, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, again,
and sort of your, a bank is a bit different to an angel investor or, or a venture capital. NAB has NAB Ventures, which I think is a $100 million fund. And I don't know what their limits would or their minimums would be, but out of the 100 million, they would probably look at con notes and those type of structures. I'm just guessing a couple of million dollars. You know, if there was 2 million limit, you know, 50 investments to fill the fund up. I mean, you can't mind Yeah. Yeah. Um, the we touched on valuation. The 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 ask here, and and we'll we'll delve into valuation in a second, but the ask can start very simply, and it can actually give you an implied valuation. Let's say I need. I need to raise $100,000 for marketing or to buy a business, I must get $100,000 and I'm only prepared to issue 20% equity in my business. $100,000 for 20%. That implies that once I've raised that money, my business, 100% of the shares is worth $500,000. So if I take out that 100,000 in cash that I've just raised, my what's called pre-money valuation is 400. Does that make sense? So you can very simply, using your ask, what, do I, what must I raise in, in money and what's the amount of equity I'm prepared to give up? That gives you an, an implied valuation already. Elevator pitch. I mean, everyone, and I'm sure the founders are sick of hearing us talk about elevator pitch, but you just simply must not underestimate the importance of an elevator pitch. If you met the perfect investor in the elevator, how would you say in one minute or three sentences what your business does? Not just what it does, how it benefits someone, which is its value proposition, and the ask. What is your ask? So if the first sentence is, we make, support, provide something for our customers which benefits them by this. So that one sentence you've explained what your business does and how it benefits. We are about to grow, expand, buy a major competitor which will deliver a benefit. It will make us the 90% market share. It will make us, it will deliver some sort of a benefit. And we are seeking an investment, we're seeking a marketing partner, we're seeking this to ramp up. Three sentences, and if I was the, the investor in the elevator, I would walk out of the elevator knowing exactly what your business does, what the value proposition is, and what you need to grow. That's all I need to then think, well, that was interesting. I might give them a call. After I give you a call, what are you going to give me? You must have a flyer or a teaser. So if I ask you for a document, you can shoot me across a very simple document. Must be less than four pages, preferably one single page. Assume zero knowledge, not just for me, the investor that you met in the elevator, but if I have to give it to my boss who wasn't in the elevator and he reads it for the first time or she reads it for the first time, zero, zero knowledge. So no understanding of your business at all. It must start with very basics. Re restate your elevator pitch with a bit more detail. Use charts, pictures, testimonials, where you can use links to video. Um, and then at the end, put your contact details. Fairly straightforward. Um, so I mentioned there's six things. The fifth thing, the fifth item you must prepare is your presentation or investor memorandum. So the investor you met in the elevator, you've given them the elevator pitch, you've given them the flyer or the teaser. Now they've come back and said, this sounds interesting. Send me a presentation or an investor memorandum. This goes into a bit more detail. And a few things you might want to include, obviously a title page, put a picture of your product or your service there and the investor's logo or name. Everyone likes to see a presentation dedicated to them. It's very simple put their name or their company logo on it. A disclaimer, um, you might, we'll talk a little bit about this and I've got a template for, for those of you that might need one. A dis disclaimer is important. When you're offering shares in your business, you come under the, the, Corps, the Corps Act, uh, you need to 
you need to ensure that you're staying within the regulations in terms of offering a share, uh, uh, an opportunity to invest in shares. And depending on your state, the, the country of the investor that you met in the elevator, that uh, disclaimer will differ. So you must seek advice on your disclaimer. Always put an executive summary up front. If the investor just reads one page, put it in the invest, executive summary. Go into some details on your company. Again, assuming zero knowledge, take them right back to the beginning. Show them the history, the evolution of the company, the good and the bad. Tell them about the time that you, you had a, um, you know, a, a takeover or a split with the partners and a change in the business or a name change. That's, that's to be expected. Who are the current owners? Um, go into some of the financials, a P&L and a balance sheet. Talk about the market, again, assuming zero knowledge. What's so exciting about your market that you operate in domestically and or internationally if you're looking to, to go international? You must put the ask. Once the, someone is familiar with their business, explain the ask. We're looking for X amount of capital and for that capital, we will offer you a percentage of equity, um, a loan note, we'll pay that back to you with an interest rate or converting to equity. Um, a board seat might be available. What else is, what is the investor getting for, for providing you with capital? Next steps, what is next available? Would you like them to sign a non-disclosure agreement? Would you like to undertake trials of your product or access to your exclusive website or site visits to your, to your business? And then what do they need to provide? Is there a letter of interest? Is there something you'd like from them before they commit to actually provide you with capital. The last thing you'll need to prepare is a data room. Um, as the name suggests, before we had internet, a data room for mergers and takeovers and corporate uh, transactions was literally a data room where investors, after they'd signed a non-disclosure agreement, would walk into a room with reams of paper and financial accounts, legal documents, and they would sit there and go through the data room. Nowadays, it's not, not fortunately not quite like that. It's, uh, you can, most accountants will provide the service um, or financial advisors have, a, have a, a website that they can use where you upload various documents so that the vendor, or sorry, so that the um, investor can, can review these documents. Basic documents include anything that you've shown them before, the flyer, the teaser, or the presentation, historical financial audited accounts if, if you're at that stage, uh, key documents, shareholders agreements, major, major contracts, um, employee agreements, whatever you would want to see, the investor would want to see, and that should be in your data room. It's often uh, useful to put in there a clear and transparent Q&A process. If you're looking to get more than one investor in there and you're expecting questions, there will always be questions, have a simple one pager of how they might ask questions and that question can anonymously be posted with the answer in the data room because sometimes it's the same question that everyone will ask. How to search for investors. This, yeah, the, the search is never complete. You could start your capital raising and you're still finding, you're still looking for investors several weeks later, but it must start somewhere. So in these three buckets, strategics, make a list of all of your suppliers, your customers, your competitors, your competitors' customers and suppliers, their shareholders, um, anyone at all that is within your... Um, uh, I'm looking for the word, I guess the environment uh, of, around your business, put them on a list. Start following them. If you can subscribe to their newsletters, be aware of what they're doing, be aware of what their shareholders are doing. Um, understand their drivers, seek them out at events. Try and, try and really sort of get under the hood of, your, of all of your strategic um, um, uh, partners. Financial investors, seriously, start with Google. I, I Google the same thing, ag, ag tech investors, all the time, and it's a different list. You know, there's different, different things pop up. Um, always try and be familiar um, 
subscribe to, again, newsletters. There are lots of ag tech uh, funding platforms out there. There's a new one almost every week. So be aware of who they are, what they're doing, what they're offering. Um, build a long list of possibles and then call them. Do not send them an email. Least of all, do not go just directly through their website inquiries form. Call them. Pick up the phone and speak to someone, or even better, walk in the front door, meet someone, have a cup of tea with them, understand what they want, and if it's not what, what you're offering them, that's fine. You can put a line through it. But if you think you're going to get someone excited by filling out the, the form on the website, um, you could be there a long time. Uh, Avcal, um, Australia Venture, um, now it's, it's changed, uh, what's it called now? If you look up Avcal, it's basically Australian Venture Capitalists and there's about 150 members on there and it'll tell you, you can search for them and it'll give you a, a list of 150 investors in Australia that are looking for early stage venture opportunities and call them. Go walk into their front door, ask to speak to one of their, one of their managers, find out what they want. Um, participate in, in events. I mean, you, there's nothing surer than you will go to um, some that aren't useful. Um, Dave, you've been in this a long time. I mean, I'm sure you've gone to things that... There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. SRI and the AgTech Gateway can help with this as well. We're going to have a demo day and, and ask the founders to pitch and the winner and runner up of that pitch will be able to attend the, uh, the international investment event of their choice. And we'll put, so we'll be, we'll be putting forward opportunities like that. We'll be making you aware of, of these events and, and where we can helping you to get there. Um, yeah. I went down to Muru Beach, which is back home. Which, which one's that? Muru. Muru. Yeah. In Melbourne. Sydney or Melbourne? In Sydney. I went to Sydney, but they, they're really um, branching out. They've got, got a pattern of Brisbane, Singapore. Um, I did three minutes elevator pitch when my partner was supposed to come to Sydney. Um, and I was hopeless, so I secretly did what I've got to get back to Sydney. But it was such potential there, it was quite incredible. In fact, so inspiring mm. that I went back to the next one. That was flyout Saturday. Night, so, mm. But um, yeah, Muru Deed, uh, it's, it's, mm. it's there, apparently. Not heard of that one. Really? Muru Deed, and that's backed by Telstra. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Three. Yeah. That particular event, they have that in London, um, Japan, and the US, and in Melbourne. And there's over 300 ag investors go to that. I mean, it is just wonderful. Um, and as Steve said, they'll give you a list of who's there, and they even give you an app nowadays to, to introduce yourself to them. Yeah. Hi, Dave, would love to chat. Uh, are you free at 3.30 this afternoon? Bing, bingo. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And then um, I go up to Brisbane because they were having a conference and 
confinement, um, lots of people, and gave a five minute pitch. Um, and there was a Japanese gentleman there who was over um, trying to sell to Australia. And um, and out of that, I went back to Japan and sort of learned quite a lot about it. And mm. um, to the investment that I've done. But really? It's just yeah. business, you yeah. know, plus branch work. Yeah. yeah. Dave, there's probably two things missing here. The one thing I haven't got up is social media or LinkedIn. Um, you know, uh, we we met the uh, the founder of the Chilean business on LinkedIn, and then had a Zoom had a Skype conversation with him at one o'clock in the morning in his pajamas, and uh, that, that that turned into one of our one of our best investments. Um, there, I keep coming back to, you know, ask your accountant, your lawyer, your stockbroker, your livestock agent. Um, there are corporate advisors out there. They will charge like wounded bulls, but they can, in many cases, at least for free, point you in the right direction. It not, costs nothing to have a conversation with them. Non-dilutive investors, such as the, the MLAs, etc., speak to your representative body. If you're in beef production or goat production, speak to MLA. If you're in, um, if you're in, uh, Helen, sounds like your business is in education. E education. So speak to your representatives or statutory bodies that might be yeah. representing well, well, education. I, I went down to Canberra and I set up um, appointments with all the interests that I knew and could. Wonderful. And we got lots of help, small business and training and whatever. Mm. That they were, really? But they yeah. were prepared to tunnel us yes. into the, the, the training organisation. Right. We just went regional. Yeah. Um, there also are grant advisors. Remember last week we had regional collab presenting, um, uh, Anne Harris and Rochelle Lay, and they, will, they can do this work for you. They can look at your business and the industry and they can point you in the right direction of what, what, what options are out there in terms of non-dilutive investors. And along a similar line as, as you know, participating in, in events, participate with research institutes, think tanks and charities. Um, now valuation, how to value your company. Um, I'll, I'll keep this pretty high level, but there's basically four ways of doing that. Uh, looking at the net tangible assets of your business, um, an earnings capitalization or, or multiple comparisons or multiple of your earnings, uh, discounted cash flow, or a sum of the parts, which is using uh, these three methodologies and combining them. The first thing you need to do is understand the single most important driver of value in your business. Is it your growing earnings? Is it you've got an asset or a group of assets or something that we're seeing a bit more of, particularly in the US, it's not creating earnings, it's not an asset, but it's got huge market share. I'm talking Facebook, Snapchat, those type of technology businesses. Um, I think if we have a follow on um, presentation, we might delve into valuation a little bit more and look at some, some comparisons. How do you do earnings capitalization and multiple comparison? The, Biggest one that you might be familiar with there is a EV to EBITDA, enterprise value divided by EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, tax depreciation and amortization. These are concepts that financial institutes are very, very familiar with. They will look at any business and they'll say that's on a EBITDA, EV EBITDA multiple of 14, it, it's too high, I paid 12 for a completely different business and they will just, that, because that's, that's how they, they, they operate. They operate within these financial metrics and they're looking for something that's less than 12 times EV, but... Uh... So, so when you're a startup, or we're just starting, and we actually are like, looking for the funding for the research, mm. okay, so we're looking at then what the value is in the market share, mm. because we have got no earnings. Mm. Yes. Yes. Where do you go? Yeah. Where we go? Yeah. Do we just sit or do we just keep plugging away? Early on, I talked about creating the ask. Yes. How much capital do you need and how that can give you an implied valuation? So let's say 
Um, uh, that's, okay, that's okay, Hugh. Let's say that example I gave, your business needs to raise $100,000 and you're prepared to offer 20% uh, of the equity. That, that creates an implied valuation of the business once you've got that $100,000 of $500,000. Then, the problem is that we don't want to get rid of any of our equity. We want Okay, so we know it's then, you, then you need to look at, at, at debt or mezzanine. Right. But if you, if, you, if you are looking at raising equity, just to work through an example of how to value your business, what I would do at, if I was in your shoes, I would say I'm, I simply have to raise 100000 I'm only prepared to offer 20%. That values the business at 500 once that, that 100,000 is on my books. So the pre-money valuation, a financial term that the investors will use, so before that 100,000 has come in is $400,000. Is that, that making sense? Okay, so $400,000. Now I would probably come back and look at uh, some valuation concepts. If I don't have any assets, any tangible assets. It's all brand value, it's all intangible, so it's, it's zero. Okay, so we'll forget about that one. Earnings capitalization, we don't have any earnings. We might have some revenue, but we don't have any earnings. Discounted cash flow. So this looks at your projected cash flow. Once we've got that 100,000 in, and we, we might do 10, 15 years projected cash flow, I'll put that 100,000 to use. I've got the increased earnings or increase the value. What do those earnings look like? And then we discount all of those earnings back to a, a net present value of today. And that's what a lot of financial institutes will do. That will give you a positive valuation, even if you don't have any tangible assets or current earnings um, today. So that's, that's what I'd do. I'd start with my ask. I must get $100,000. I'm only prepared to issue uh, 20%. That gives me a pre-money valuation of 400. If I then do a discounted cash flow and that comes back and says, geez, my cash flows over the next 15 years, say that discounted at an appropriate discount rate, my business is only worth $200,000. The investor will know that. They'll work that out. And you've got to think about, okay, that 20% I was only prepared to issue, maybe it needs to be 50%. So if I do that, the, the 100,000 means a 200,000 post money, uh, means it's 100,000 valuation pre-money. Have I lost everyone or is that? Hugh, okay. Um, okay, how to negotiate and execute the deal. There's far more than just the, the um, valuation to negotiate. Steve mentioned break fees, uh, or sorry, paying for due diligence, the investor paying for due diligence or asking you to pay for due diligence. I remember seeing a company, an investment fund, asking the, the company, it was an education business that wanted a buyer, wanted someone to take them over, this hedge fund said to them, we'll take a look at you, but you'll put up $250,000 for us to do the work, to do all the flights and take a look at your business. It's going to cost you $250,000. Um, break fees, instead of the company offering $250,000, the investor might, might say to you, okay, we'll take a look at your business. Here's a, a basic term sheet, but if you don't like the proposal we put to you at the end of our term uh, or at the end of the due diligence, uh, it's going to cost you $100,000 uh, if we don't do a deal. You have to pay us $100,000 if we don't do a deal. Um, so again, that's a negotiation. Exclusivity. Sometimes investors will want a period of exclusivity. No one else can look at your books or look at the opportunity except them for a period of time, a couple of weeks, maybe a month. Yeah. Um, Again, valuation, sometimes data and sensitive information. If, if it's a strategic investor looking at you, you might need to negotiate. They've only got two weeks to, to get to know your business because they're a competitor. They might, they might use that information against you. Do 
doing electric property, they're looking at your data, they're looking at that. What do you do? Do you, do you need something there to safeguard you as a business, don't you? Well, sure. I mean, you can start with a non disclosure agreement to start with, but that just in typically means that they can't take that information and, and share it. Um, to give them a period of exclusivity or, or restricted access to sensitive data, the simplest way to do that is to provide them with hard, hard copies only. So they can't download data or get access to live feeds or anything like that. They get a simple snapshot of particular data and it's, it's on a piece of paper. So it's not being regularly updated. Um, One thing about that, I always have a question Looking at a corporate, like someone in the same uh, general field of marketing, in the same sort of thing, and they um, and they want to get access to uh, look at the source code, for example. Um, probably not going to stop them re-implementing it. Re you know, mm. in another, like you know, um, yeah, they do a bit of reverse engineering. Yeah. Like the code. There's always this idea that the person who's seen the code can't be involved in reverse engineering and stuff, but mm. they can pass a piece of paper yeah. back and forward with the tests on it to make sure that it's kind of working. So it's one of those things that if you're a very heavily technical business, be very um, I think it's quite hard to go through this go through this process without kind of putting away the computer to go through the paper. Yeah, this is Dave, break fees work both ways as well. Yep. You know, if you said to Allflex, um, okay, we're going to do some preliminary due diligence and we're going to have our code is the last thing that you're going to see, but before you see it, we're going to agree a, a term sheet or an em a memorandum of understanding and there's going to be a break fee in there. So if you, get, if you look at my code and you don't want to do any further work or deal together, that's going to cost you an amount. So if you're worried about them taking the, the, the secrets from the cookie jar and using them themselves, you could look at doing something like that. But this is, in, it, it, there's just three simple things in any negotiation. Know your position. If your code is the secret in the cookie jar, you know, keep, keep that back here. But also try and understand the investor's position. Do they is all they want is the code and they just want to find out how to steal it from you, then you've got to work that out. You've got to understand that and, and, and keep it from them. If they genuinely do, Steve used the word chemistry, if they really do want to work with you and you're working together and um, you, know, there's, you get the feeling that they do actually want to invest in your business, trying to understand their position and then be creative to a solution. Um, so that, that's, that's what we try and take to every negotiation, understanding what we've got, what are, what's of value, what do we stand to lose, and understand the other side's position, put yourself in their shoes, and then think laterally. You know, can you use a break fee? Can you talk about exclusivity? Um, can you put a, a term sheet in front of them up front that they, they need to sign? Might not mean anything, non-binding and indicative, but for them to go, take that to their manager to actually get a signature, just sort of, you know, it, it, it requires a bit of commitment, even if it's non-binding. The other thing just on the, the strength of confidentiality or NDAs is, is most of them do address you can't do those things and you can't go and do the following things. Mm. And you can, you can tailor it to say, look, the thing we're really concerned about is our source code. So when it mm. comes to that, Mm. You actually identify us. It's not just an acknowledgement that we find some of the loss of as a result of that breach. Mm. It's you flat out identify us. Yep. But of course, then that's only worth anything if the counterparty is an entity of substance. If they're a two dollar company themselves, great, they provide you a promise not to breach, but if they mm. do, there's nothing there. 
attention, which is really annoying. Mm. Like, so if they're an entity of substance mm. and you put it down, then you know, the most companies will kind of be content to you know, stick to the rules, I guess. And you would need to be prepared to take that that agreement and 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 have the ability to challenge or to follow that through or legal proceedings. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to have a document, but if, if they don't believe that you're actually going to follow through with challenging it, then yeah, what can you do? That, that's why there's protection there. And there's, there's no such thing as a standard NDA. Mm. The best protection is that the counterparty is an entity of substance. They've got something to lose if you sue them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, that's exactly this sort of sentence. Understand their position. You know, uh, have they got something to lose? Can they indemnify you um, and make good on any any value lost to your business? If the answer to that's no. Well, um, yeah, maybe think 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 twice about it. Mm. Uh, there we go. So took a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, but that's the end of the presentation. How are we time-wise, Hugh? Um, as I said, the presentation will be available for, for everyone. Um, and if you've got anything specific, any we, we do have templates of flyers, company presentations. Happy to talk to you individually about how to look at valuations of your business. Um, so by all means, please please get in touch. Um, uh, questions. Yes. Um, just, I guess, for dealing with the startup world, what are some red flags or what are the common mistakes you see? People with low, low equity or like the low valuation of their business, just issues that you've seen maybe in startups, um, mistakes they make essentially as in this process if they're undervaluing their business or they have such a high ask on it that they're. Mm. I guess just little tips and tricks, I guess, that you've experienced mm. to see the process. Yep. Okay, a really good question. Um, a couple in different areas. I think the most common um, thing is self, uh, self doubt um, uh, and skepticism. People can often be very, very, very uh, protective of their IP and very concerned about meeting with anyone to ever talk to anything about it. And you're just not going to raise capital if you, if you do that. You have to step off the pontoon and, and onto, the, onto, the boat, onto the boat. Um, you do need the correct agreements. You do need you know, a non-disclosure agreement, all of that. But you do need to share what's in your mind with potential investors. If you're asking them for something, you've got to be as open, in our opinion, as open and as upfront as you can be. So um, the second, there's no such thing as a, as a bad meeting. You know, people are often thinking about the, the investor target list and, you know, I won't bother with them or I won't bother with that or this person, I don't think they invest in this. There's no such thing. You always get something from a, from a meeting with an investor. Um, so always just do the do the time, meet them, call them, go in and see them. Don't just fill out the standard application form on this on their spreadsheet, on their website. Valuation, um, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in the shoes of the investor. If it's a strategic or a financial investor, it's not hard to work out if you would do the investment if you're in their shoes. Now, they're, they're people at the end of the day. They 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 sure they crunch the numbers they look at things but they'll they'll get a feeling about is this does this make sense is that valuation ridiculous and you'll know yourself would you do it you know your business would i would i put that hundred thousand dollars in the answer is no why would some why would an why would an investor do it um so you've got to be you've got to be realistic i think um that's possibly a mistake that's sometimes made uh, you've, 
and back to valuation and that ask, you've got to demonstrate that that 100,000 in that example that's being provided, that gives you uh, a step up, a value accretion, whether it's in earnings per share, whether it's in tangible assets, whether it gives you a market share expansion, it's got to demonstrate that that 100,000 takes you from here to here. Too often, I think, uh, people look at their business and they say, well, geez, you know, my, my costs over the next year are going to be 200 grand. I've just got to raise 200 grand. They don't think about 200 grand is going to take me from here up to here. It's really important. Um, they're probably the main ones. <laughs> okay, it's really hard to... I mean, I've been doing this for about three years, right? And every point where I've thought, oh, it's just probably time to start thinking about raising the next one. It was, it was for the wrong reasons. Like, at first, it was because our initial investor said we didn't get it. And make our investment work. Yeah. Mm. And that's a really, like, and there was quite a lot of pressure from them to do that. Right. And without your revenue and without looking out with two customers, yeah. that's supposed to tell So, we have to push that. Mm. Second time, we basically choose where capital had quite a lot to revenue. Um, and you're kind of raising money to stay high. A bit of Yeah. Um, you you touched on a few things there. Um, you're now at the stage of recognising that you you could take your revenue from from here to here, and that's that's of interest to someone. You also talked about potentially exiting, so selling the business. Yeah, you know, I've seen um, uh, a company pretty much give away. Uh, I think it was five, might have been ten percent share to the business. A, a competitor that they wanted to take them out, take them over. And they basically gave away a small amount of equity so that this ultimate, the person they wanted the, to buy the business could understand how it's going, see the books come through, see it growing, see it taking its revenue from there to there. And it's exactly what happened. In the end, they said, right, we're, we're going to buy you now after about two or three years. Nothing greases the wheels of cooperation like, like co-investment or, or co-ownership literally gave them a share in the business and in the end they got an exit because of it. I think also some of you mentioned it there when you mentioned what are you your losses when does an idea or a business concept become a startup company? You know that if it's got its revenue, if it's got an office, when when in that process does that happen? When does it go from an idea and this is really good to choose I don't think that. Yeah. I just um, 
and really thought I was learning new as a startup person in the business, right? But what I failed to recognize in myself was that in my previous professional career, I'd actually started, thrown off the NGO, um, an idea that I had, I'd built it, you know, play therapy and schemes for children in hospitals through caravan time, until it was all over Queensland and it was the same as children from Henry Cox took it over and it was really became, you know, I got funded and I did all this work. And here I'm thinking, I can't have to start a business, I've never done anything like this before. And yet I had done it and didn't recognise it. So when you come in to learn about a startup and you hear all these things that you're talking about, what I think perhaps we fail to recognise is that in actual fact, through life, we actually have had many experiences. And that goes for just getting mm. married, buying a house, buying whatever. Mm. And, you know, they're all the things. And I think perhaps in startups, we're actually, what you said, Hamish, is, is afraid that we're going to take those wrong steps and, and mm. be conned or because in life, you know, all those things do, are all the things, the red mm. flags that you take notice of. So I think sometimes it is just good to go to the edge mm. and step over. Yeah. Oh. There's, there's, so long as you're learning from the mistakes, I don't think there's such a such thing as a bad mistake. I mean, Um, I mean, you 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 might have been frustrated with the time that you put into that day, but you now know what you don't need to do. Um, The other, the other thing that a lot of financial institutions might tell you, and this was Sam's experience in Israel, was the second question after the first one, what do you do, is what's your IP position? Yeah. yeah. Mm. IP protection, yeah. There, there are there are there are competing um, views or perspectives on IP protection. I think you know there are some investors, as I said, that will say that's the second question they ask: How secure is your IP? Then there are um, there are the practical considerations. Some IP is um, as much as anything; it's know-how which is um, in someone's, someone's mind, a company might own this IP, but how to actually use it, how to, how to actually um, mechanically facilitate a process or a product or an outcome, that might, that might be in someone's head. So that, that, that person might, and you, you can legally account for that, um, but it also can be costly. And you know, there are companies that spend millions on IP protection um, and uh, someone else has might have re-engineered re it or reverse engineered it or come up with something slightly different um, that you, that you know you're you're still sort of 
stuck in the water. So it's a different. Um, so it's saying that I was or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not probably qualified to talk about IP protection. Andrew might might be far more, or, but to me, it's it's um, there are differing views. Yeah, there's a company called Allbirds. You know, you'd know Allbirds, David. They manufacture the woolen shoes, sneakers, and sneakers out of bamboo, and not one single IP protection. In fact, they openly talk about how they manufacture the processes they go through so that other people adopt it and a merino shoe or a woolen shoe or a bam uh, environmentally sustainable adoption is is adopted more broadly as a groundswell and they're just they're just a part of it so really mm. Mm. Yeah, some, sometimes, and look, as I said, I'm not an IP expert, but sometimes my belief is that your best protection is 100% market share. Whatever it is, if, if you've got them, and it does 100, market share, whatever it is, if people just like your product, your service, your whatever it is, the piece of paper in my opinion, is less important. And I think, I mean, one thing I did learn over the last couple of years is that patents are not necessarily the greatest. They're only as good as your ability to, to, to uphold them or to challenge them. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you're obviously in the business of buying the targets for the event. Do you take into account IP trademark or whatever? Yeah. 
Yes, that's right. Mm. So if, if you've got prior art, you can basically say, we have received on the basis that the current patents are invalid. We don't need a license agreement. We can't be suing. Mm. And that we, if we put it up to show that we go to challenge this patent, here's the evidence that we have. And that, that's good enough for most of mm. so the other line is up to the very interesting work in this application. We, really you, you, it does vary. We, we raised um, 10 million pounds for a company in Edinburgh that was all about its IP commercialisation and they didn't own the IP. They had a document which was uh, access to that IP. Said that for yeah, fif licenses. 15, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 years access <laughs> to it, but we don't own it and we may never own this, this IP, but we have the right to to commercialise it for the next 15 years. It, it does, but it, it was all, to your point, it's about what the investor wanted. Some investors were just simple, you must be joking, this is worth nothing. And then some other investors said, well, this is worth 30 million pounds. Um, well, that, that's more of a, that's more of a, a risk management. You have to sort of, that's just give the investor an idea that can you be stopped? You know, will this, will my investment evaporate overnight before something yeah. stops? Yeah. Or have you got the potential to do most of it? And that's it's, mm. so I mean I, I haven't come across any more that I've spoken to yet that basically said up front what's your IP position. All they they were interested only from that perspective. Yeah. So will this make my investment in that range? Yeah. I was interested in Sam's feedback from his trip to Tel Aviv because he said that was that was a very big question. What is your IP position? Now, his business is a little bit different, perhaps, um, but he was asked time and time again, what is your IP security position? And so, to Andrew's point, those investors, that's, that's how they think. IP position, IP position, the strength of it. It can also be a bit of a, um, you know, uh, a rejection, que a, a question to move on, you know, a reason to leave the conversation there. We, we see that all the time. Um, you know, we'd ask, we'd start the presentation and the investor would sort of say, oh, you're, you're in Latin America. We don't do Latin America. Sorry. Yeah. Um, same thing with IP protection. Oh, you don't have IP protection. See you later. It can be a bit like that. So, so when you say that, um, are you saying that, as someone who is Essex, that, um, that if somebody said, oh, well, we have a trademark in this and that, would you assume trademark would mean they own the IP? Uh, well, not necessarily. Um, I mean, I'm not a IP expert, but no, I don't think so. So that was the question that we came to have the... the I mean, I, I have a, I have a, presumably, IP protection is happy customers, you know, market share. Um, if you have a, co a competitive price, you have a large market share, you have a product, happy customers, that's, that's, a, that's, that's strong uh, protection. Um, the, Breed plan, which is the, the beef and dairy genetics um, 
business owned by ABRI. I mean, I, I would presume that that's very robust in terms of IP protection, but there's nothing of its size or scale in the world. It, it's just, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why. Um, that, that to me is the most attractive thing about it, is that they uh, recognise 15 countries around the world. They have one of the world's largest databases of estimated breeding values. To me, that's the most attractive thing about that business. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. There is also Is it? Yeah. Yeah. How much does previous investment impact future investment from someone say? I'm not imagining oh, yeah. startups go completely scrap it all the way through private. Yeah, yeah, no, really good point. Is it? I'm sure there's cases where it works in your favour, mm. cases where it doesn't. There's competitors trying to invest in the same company. Do you, you, you might have all heard terms like seed capital, Series A, Series B, etc. Um, do, do you understand? So, so seed is the very initial capital. Series A is the first, I guess, um, first time after seed. Series B is obviously after the Series A, etc. So it's just a way of counting how many times you've raised capital. Then you have pre-IPO capital. The amount of times I've seen a company think, oh, okay, well, we'll do it for, we'll do our seed at five cents and then we'll, we'll go out and do Series A at 10 cents and then we'll do Series B at 20 cents and then we'll do IPO at, at, at a dollar. And it's just, it, it just doesn't happen that way. You, the initial public offering on an ASX. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in someone's financial model, their forecast, or a seed raising document where they're saying, we're raising at 10 and we are going to raise at 20. It just doesn't happen that way. I mean, they, they put that on a piece of paper, but that raising at 20, whenever that happens at 20 cents, that will be determined then by those investors. And I have seen plenty where the IPO was going to be done at a dollar and it was done at 20 cents. So um, valuation is determined by the incoming investors at the time of investment. Yeah. Um, Mm. Um, mm. So there's, there's nothing to stop you from raising money today at a dollar a share and then raising money in two years' time at five cents. Other than it makes you feel bad because the value, perceived value per share of your business has gone down. Yeah. You can still do it. Mm. Okay. Anything further? An hour and a half, not a bad session. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Hugh.